Big Sky Howdy, and welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. And with us this time, we have another returning guest you guys are going to be glad to hear from again. And this person just happens to do research all over the place on the, the little people, the proto-pygmies. And you all know who I'm talking about. It's Robin Moonshadow from Strange Realms. Go find Strange Realms. It's on, like, Facebook and, like, on the Internet and all over the place. Strange Realms. That's, a, that's her site. Go there. Sign up now. Okay, and with that, let's have Robin on the show. Welcome to the show, Robin. Hi, Duke. Thanks for having me back again. Got lots of info this time. Not yeah. so long. Looking forward to having you back here because I know that since the last time we uh, we really had you on to do a, a full, full-blown full discussion about what you've been up to, um, you've been doing a lot of stuff out in the field and been all over the place. You came down here to the lower 48 and did some squatching and proto-pygmy hunting, hobbiting, down here and uh, as well as all the stuff that's going on up there. So I just figured it'd be great to have you on for uh, a little catch up time here and bring everybody else up to speed on what you've been up to. Oh yeah. I've been, I've been busy and I've been loving every second of it. <laughs> you learn so much when, when you're out in the field and you actually make connections uh, from, from one area to know to another in regards to both uh, Bigfoot and proto pygmies. It's just fabulous. Yeah, and this is fortuitous for you because you're more interested in going out hobbiting and looking for the itty bitty little guys. But most of the time, in any areas where you'll find them, are usually the same areas where you'll find Bigfoot. So as long as you're there, you might as well do some Bigfoot research too, right? Oh, exactly. Because uh, they don't compete for food. So little people and Bigfoot will occupy the same space. Not always, but I can say with sure accuracy at least 90 percent of the places i've been in we see little people and uh bigfoot tracks and, and evidence that's interesting yeah and uh i know for uh, one of the people that you got to go out with is uh has also been on the show here uh mr sasquatch in ontario up there blaine tyler from the bigfoot barn you went and uh what was it hit algonquin park up there with him didn't you uh, no, that was with another gentleman. Yeah, I did go with Blaine last summer. Yeah, it was a great day trip. We had a fabulous time. Um, he took me and showed me some tracks that were deep enough to be left o over the winter. So, so they, they were still were, there when you guys got there. They were like, that heavy. Yeah, they were yeah. that heavy. I was amazed. I mean, like another winter and, and they'd probably be gone. But yeah, the, it was so heavy. I'm looking at it. And I'm calculating the weight on this, and we're we're thinking, you know, this sucker's 1,100 pounds to yeah. leave that, have it still stay over the winter. And as you know, up here in Canada, we get freezing rain, and we get the snow. We're not talking light snow; we're talking heavy snowfall. And I mean, yeah, it, it's it's pretty heavy, heavy weather. Oh yeah, and that's like in Canada. Scary. That's your main thing. Your main export and everything is snow. Even, it's snow, snow, yeah. <laughs> even export snow tires made out of your native deposits of snow, right? Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they just put food coloring in them to make them, <laughs> make them look kind of blackish. <laughs> Why is my yeah. tire melting? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we, we also figured, uh, I, I calculated that, the, that this one particular Bigfoot that was so heavy, it, it, it's it's got to be at least 11 feet tall. Because the strides between his footsteps were pretty good. I mean, not so much when he was going up the hill, because you got to put more weight into your legs and your feet and push down when you're going up the hill. But at the top of the hill, where it evens out, you could get more of a gauge of how heavy and how tall this particular one was. So yeah, it was it was awesome to see that. And then then we go across the road to have a little peek, and here I find a little handprint with a, a footprint beside it. Going up the hill, we couldn't cast it because it was on so much of an angle. Uh, and since then, I've actually remedied, remedied that on, on how I can cast them when they're like that. But yeah, it was just the, the little guy was just pulling himself up the, up the hill, you know, uh, hand over hand, pulling his feet up. So I'm like, cool. And you could actually see how he did that. And Blaine has that on his channel if you all want to take a peek at that. Because it was really cool to find that right out of nowhere. And I don't find a lot of handprints. I, I think I've found, in all these years, I think I've maybe found three handprints. Yeah, they are definitely uncommon. I had that nice uh, print that was found underneath a bridge in the Rio Grande River in December that we shared. We talked about yep. that. Yeah. And again, that, but yeah, that you don't one see there. That very often. you got to figure, well, there's so little. How often are we going to notice something like that? 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, from that picture, that that picture that you're talking about is very unique because you see that it's it, it's deep. The the track goes really deep, and it doesn't really match with the other picture that goes with it because the hand is too small for that particular foot. And, and then after looking at it and talking to uh, another tracker friend of mine, we figured that that was a female, maybe a male, mm-hmm. carrying a baby. Yeah. And that's why the handprint was so small, because no doubt mommy or daddy leaned over to, to get up in that bit of a, he was stuck probably, and baby put its hand down. So yeah, that that is an amazing, unique picture that is. But from that, you can kind of calculate how small the babies are. Let's yeah. say that particular little person, we'll say, is equivalent to two years old our age. I mean, that that's not much bigger than, than a puppy. Yeah, like last, uh, last summer when we were up in the uh, Hidden Valley, uh, Team Deep South was running around looking for stuff and uh, going going down some of the roads and little backwoods tracks and stuff we haven't had a chance to even look on yet. And one of them, they saw this weird-looking boulder pile just a short distance off the road. They went over and took a look at it. And on the opposite side of it, there was like a little cave about a foot and a half tall that went underneath this boulder pile. There was about six feet of sand leading into it. And in that six feet of sand, there was all kinds of little three and four inch long moccasin tracks going oh. in. And right above it, there was a lattice work of like twigs or branches or something that made like a little canopy over it or something. All you would have to do is throw some leaves on it or something and you would have sunshade. But that was stretched across the boulders right above it too. Um, so yeah, that was uh, Texas Cat, Cacklacky, <laughs> and uh, those guys found that one. Yeah, some camouflage to hide the door. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, in this in this area, it would be the Narumbi, so you wouldn't want to probably go shake hands with them anyway. Oh, I would try. <laughs> yeah, I know you would. I would. I absolutely would. I would love to make contact with with one of the little native people, or or maybe the the Meme Goessing that we have here. Uh, and of course, I got one on my trail cam. They're little hairy people, and we know that little hairy people can be an awful menace. Uh, um, these guys aren't so bad. Like, how many times have I been in my areas and, and he could have just put the stones to me and he hasn't. But, you know, I call it bribery. I leave granola bars for them. Mm-hmm. So, of course, it's equivalent exchange. I leave something for them. They leave something for me. But I tell you, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned it, but last summer back in my one of my areas, uh, I found footprints, little people footprints. They were little moccasin prints. I'm like, oh, these are good and I'm going to cast them. I do have pictures of that. And I think it was about the second track that I started pouring the plaster into, and I was getting little rocks thrown at me, you know, <laughs> lower down, yeah. just right out of the bushes. And I think I had three or four thrown at me, and it they hit me. You know, it didn't hurt, but they hit me. And I was thinking, what the? And I realized what I'd done. I didn't thank you for, uh, thank them for leaving me those tracks to cast. And it wasn't until then I realized they're leaving them for me on purpose for me to do this because uh, I've been leaving them granola bars. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, and I, I thank them right away and I apologize, you know, because that's extremely rude of me not to do that. I apologize profusely and I actually left them two granola bars that day. And I haven't had a problem since, as long as I say thank you. <laughs> Sounds like a good day, uh good thing to to do from what i hear the uh, some of these little people like the mimis up north um the legend is that if you hear their music in the woods or something you should not go toward it if you accidentally yes, you stumble upon them and see them or something uh you better do something to make it up or you're going to get a curse thrown on you yeah something will, will happen to you i mean they, they will pester you they will torment you i mean you can apologize but you will have to make amends for disturbing them because when they when they gather in their little groups like that, that that's a special time for them. So you're not supposed to disturb them. Uh, like in the spring of the year uh, in, in some parts of America, when the little people are out and about, you're not supposed to bug them at that time of the year because they're busy. Interestingly, I had one of my uh, local friends here in Missoula tell me that uh, him and two of his friends were up in Patty Canyon after hours and that's supposed to be up there after dark and they had a little uh campfire going that they were letting die down and getting ready to come back again and i'm guessing it was like 
maybe around 11, probably wasn't any later than that. And uh, one of them started, he went over to the edge of the woods to take a leak and started hearing some weird noise c coming from the woods and followed a little bit. And it sounded like, you know, little drums and instruments playing. And then all of a sudden it stopped and he walked a little bit further and there was no, no sound coming, but there was a whole pile of little teeny campfires about six inches across and like maybe, you know, six to 10 feet away from each other, spread out all over this whole little area in the woods. They were celebrating something. Yeah, so he turned around and got the hell out of there right away. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, uh, if I had to come across that, I think I would do exactly the same thing because, you know, if you didn't, well, you, you have no idea the whoop ass that's going to come on you if you don't. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, the, the May May, the, the hairy little person that I actually got, on my trail camera, it was amazing because uh, it was before one of my last trips uh, down south last year. And I'm just walking along and just for the heck of it, I said, you know, it'd be really nice if I could get one of you guys on the trail cameras. I would very love to, to see one of you. And I'm thinking I'm talking to the native little people that are here. So, you know, I, I get my two weeks after and I'm checking my cameras and I got that guy and he purposefully let himself be allowed to have his picture taken. And I'm looking, I'm like, and I knew exactly what it was that I saw. And I'm like, holy, you know what? That's a main mega thing. Because he's exactly how the First Nations up here describe them. Hairy and ugly. Yeah. and so Little hairy dwarves, yeah. Yeah. And he's just amazing. He's very primitive looking. And I'm, I'm I, you know, I got to get a good look at his face. But he's very primitive looking. And, and I'm like, every time I say he's ugly, I feel bad in case he's lurking around my house. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, and, by their standards, you might be handsome. You know, they just don't look exactly like you. Yeah, we might be ugly to them because well, yeah. we don't have hair. But yeah. I do see why that they are mistaken for, for young or juvenile Bigfoot because they're hairy. Like, they don't wear shoes. And I was actually able to get a foot cast of that. So I've got the two foot casts. Uh, of the little moccasin prints and, and a barefoot. And you can tell it's not a baby. And you can tell it's not a juvenile. I've got a juvenile Bigfoot cast. It's six inches long. And its toes are completely different. They're not even, they're not on an angle like ours are. But right. with the, the, uh, the May Mega Wessing, his are on an angle. So, I mean, up until that point, I didn't know I even had May Mega Wessings in the area. So I, I thought for a second, you know, is this a native person who took its moccasins off? But, you, you know, it doesn't even line up. But, you know, they're all four inches no matter what. Uh, the only other two that I have is a three inch. It is a three inch, and I believe that's a female, because then I found a two inch beside her. Huh. And I'm thinking it's a mummy and a baby. And after reading about Homo Luzon, uh, they found those skeletal remains I think it was early last year in the Philippines. That's how I came to that conclusion, where the females are smaller than the males. Do you think there's any connection between uh, the Mamies and the Pennsylvania Alabama witches? No. What, what I think that the apple witches or apple snitches are could be indigenous chimps. I know it sounds a little bit far-fetched, but uh, they look like chimps. They act like chimps. And we know chimps can get pretty vicious. Yeah. And, you know, they would have come across here and just moved right on into Pennsylvania. I mean, Pennsylvania is an area where you got all kinds of stuff going on there uh, way, way back. Oh, I know. It's dangerously to close Eastern to Ohio. Time. I mean, the Seneca First Nations that are there talked about the, the uh, apple witches even before white people, the white settlers came. Yeah. So, well, I know I we didn't import them or anything. They were already here. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, we, we've had things that would come across from Asia and, you know, uh, and because we don't know completely know every single thing about geology, so it's not a hard stretch thinking that they would come there and, and make their area there. Yeah. But now it's not supposed to be in that area anymore, which I am suspicious about. But I get reports of, of apple snitches in, in Washington State. And that whole surrounding area, and people say, well, they're supposed to be extinct. I'm like, no, they're not. They just moved out. They just spread out. Four seasons going on today. Shed sunshine, snow, sleet, rain, back to sunshine. 
I'm telling you. So I walked down here, and I'm like, walking around this gravel bar right here, you know, checking things out. When I come over here, I see something dug out, and I thought, well, maybe some deer did that. <laughs> I want to show you guys this. You can see where I'm standing around right here, looking around here. I'm going to kneel down here. Doesn't that look like a little footprint? <laughs> oh my god. Look how small it is. Yeah, my signal out here is kind of crappy, guys. I can't help a little way. don't know what kind of animal has feet like ours. And you can see the water is receding down. I was actually following this black sand line here. That'd be a good place right there to test for uh, gold. As you can see there's some pyrite right there. That shiny stuff, that's pyrite. little hands fingers was in there digging around but there's no no tracks coming down this way to the river edge it's only coming up from here what's well, the river otter I don't know Deer tracks right there. They're old though. A couple of days. And yes, before anybody posts on here. Ohio does have river otters. It's in our guidebook and they, they have stocked them in this particular river too, the Kosing River. But I didn't know they had a foot like ours footprint like that see how the toes come around just like a person a, a human foot yeah I'll have to show this in Robin Moon Shadow Knows a little bit more of me than than uh, um, she she knows more about the little people. I'll talk to you guys later. Squatch home. They got something along those lines up in Alaska too, because I've heard a few reports up there that talk about the same kind of uh, hairy little people. They don't wear any clothes or anything. There's one report of one of them stealing a kid right out of the front yard of the house that he was playing in. Yep. Yeah, we've we've heard reports of that of, of chimps doing that as well. Wild chimps, and not always necessarily to play with them. The Usually chimps are, not. No. No. No, because you know chimps are cannibalistic and they do hunt other monkeys. Yep. And that's why you should never feel uh, guilt if you have to smack a chimp. They deserve it. They're oh, little chimps cannibal monsters. Nasty. Chimps can be pretty nasty because they're <laughs> very, they're very primal, and everything evolves around just 
you know, food, mating, and territory. Yeah. It is just the way that they're made. Now, the bonobos, they're not like that. They were uh, another kind of chimp. All they do is run and play, and they're happy and have sex all day. So they're happy all the time. Yeah. And they're, they're hilarious, and they don't act like the other chimps. Uh, they don't engage in warfare like the other chimps do. The bonobos would prefer, if that's going on, they just move out of the way. They so don't the bon- like Bonobos are like the hippies of the anthropoid world. That's right. They the, are the hippies, the, the chimps. The, the yep. chim- chimpanzees are like the military of the anthropoid world. Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of funny. I mean, like they didn't even... Uh, uh, classify the bonobos as a, a separate type of chimp until recently. Well, we even see that in Planet of the Apes, yeah. where you, you've got the the uh, the series, of course, the two main chimps. One of them being played by uh, oh, his name escapes me now. Um, Roddy, Roddy, Roddy McDowell. Yeah, Roddy McDowell. That was the original. Yeah, him, him and his wife. You see that they would be the bonobos mm-hmm. uh, of the group, and then you got the other ones that are engaging in warfare. But yeah, taking orangutans. Yeah, and they're orangutans. Yeah, but if you actually observe orangutans, they're like 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 two year old kids are slowly learning things. Mm-hmm. But as, as gentle as they can be, you know, they can get pretty nasty sometimes too. They're a little bit different than the other apes, though, because they're solitary, and the other apes are troop guys. Yep. That's right, yeah, because they prefer to be by themselves, and then maybe they'll group up from time to time for, for like, food and mating, but then they're off again. Yeah, the, the orangutans are more like the uh, carnivorous yeti monsters that live up in the northern part of your country. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and I've seen one of the uh, ginger-colored Bigfoot, and they've, uh, you know, I saw that that kind when I was in my 30s. And then I found out later, you know, like 10 years later, that my brother saw one as well. Uh, the one I saw was smaller, and I figured it was a juvenile. And uh, my brother and I were trying to figure out, you know, is it the same one or is it a different one? Because the one that he saw was over six feet. It was leaning up against a tree with its leg up trying to hide. And it would just lean forward a little bit to see if anybody was seeing him. Uh, um, uh, Victoria Day Squatching, that's... Uh, on my YouTube channel, also Strange Realms. That's uh, you can hear where my brother gives that account of when he saw that one. Right on. So yeah, that was up on our our mountain, close to to and, where I grew up. Yeah. And everybody, get over there and and subscribe on Strange Realms on YouTube because you, you know we need we need all the help we can get. Any channel that's actually putting out anything real is getting censored, and their subscribers are getting unsubscribed. If you think you are subscribed to Strange Realms, check and see if you still are. And uh, click the notification bell, or they won't send you notifications anyway. But yeah, anybody, if you're not already over there and subscribed, uh, go go subscribe. Yeah, I like to, you know, inform everybody as to what's going on and what's going on around, especially in the video. Uh, the last one that I put up, I know everybody was going to like it, especially if, if you like proto-pygmies. Uh, my American Squatching partner and I were in Pink Beds, North Carolina, and uh, one of the main reasons for going there is because, of course, little people sighting, Bigfoot sightings. Yeah, that's two good reasons. Yeah, so um, uh, we're about 15 minutes in, and let me tell you, this was a, it was a, a long walk. <laughs> I, I've done longer. We, we did the, the loop, which is about six miles around, but it was well worth it. Um, so we're about 15 minutes in, and we've met some people. Uh, wasn't overly busy, I would say, you know, typical day. It was kind of chilly, actually. And so 15 minutes in, and as, as I'm watching the footage back, it was kind of cool. I'm, I'm hearing these noises in the bushes, and they sound like little people to me, you know, a sound. But at that point, I'm thinking, well, this could be anything. Could be, could be squirrels, could be anything. Don't want my imagination to get away with me. And I, and I said right out loud, oh, sounds like we might have little people. I don't think anything else of it. And so we move on. And just right there on a log it is a piece of jewelry, a butterfly. It was a butterfly earring. It's a monarch. And it, it's, uh, it's copper or brass. And the uh, butterfly on top, it, I think it's called electrolyted on it. And it was just sitting right there on the log. Okay, now, if anybody had to drop that earring 
or fall out of their ear. It would have been right on the path. Yeah, right. It wouldn't be just sitting balanced on the It wouldn't have been sitting right there just for us. I didn't notice it at first because I was looking for tracks. Uh, my partner noticed it. And he's like, is that a butterfly? And, and he's like, do you think that's left for us? And I turned and I looked at it. I'm like, yeah, I think you're right. And that's that's the second time that's happened to us. Uh, when we were in Piscuit uh, National Forest last year, excuse me, year before last, and we're walking the trail, and right there was a wild grape and a mushroom side by side. And I knew by just looking at it that it's just so out of place. I mean, there, there's no wild grapes around that area, and there's certainly no mushrooms. And I'm like, that was put there for us. There's two of them. There's two of us. And I didn't have anything to give them in return at that time, so I didn't take them. Uh, now, this time, I'm thinking, I got nothing to give them. I can't. I got nothing to give back, and then I'm thinking, I'm going to give them a quarter. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't have any Canadian change. Our quarter has a deer on it. I thought that would be nice. So I'm looking through my change. I don't have one. And then I came across an American quarter and had birds on it. And I'm like, they'll like this, and I left it there. Yeah, that's uh, that would probably be an eagle. Uh, I'm not sure what it was, but I thought that they would like it. <laughs> yeah, and, and further down the road, uh, we come across juvenile Sasquatch tracks. So we followed them for a while. I don't have that up on the channel yet with everything going on around worldwide, but I'm getting to that this week. And so we followed them for a while and it went right into the bushes and into a swampy area that I can't follow. Couldn't get in there. Awesome. Well, well, by the time they hear this, you'll have the video up and you'll I will, have yeah, it over to me. Yeah. And you guys will be watching it right now as you're talking about it. So don't yeah, worry. About you, it. You'll really love it. It's just, especially the butterfly. It's really cool. And we found a really weird track that I couldn't identify. And, you know, that never happened. And uh, we get back and I'm looking through my, looking through stuff online trying to figure out what this track was. And we still don't know what it was. But. What did it look like? It had three toes. Yeah. And it, it wasn't the kind of three toes where somebody had lost toes. It was just three toes. And it was long on both sides, left and right, and round at the back. And it was a continuous yeah. pattern of three toes on both feet. So you got to see more than one track. Did it have uh, claws? Uh, no, I didn't see any claw marks. But oh. my partner, my partner wondered if it was some type of a lizard person, a lizard man. Because you know that there are the legends of the lizard men in the Carolinas.
littler ones would be easier than not. it broke anyway. Let's have a look at our little track from yesterday. This here is nothing, but I'm leaving it to, for something to hold on to. So, we have half of the toe here that's a big toe. And right here is a toe. Here is a toe. Over here is another toe. So I'll turn it sideways. And what you can see is the impression of the foot and the heel. You can see it's the typical four inches long. That's a better view of it right there. Yeah. Well, anywhere that there's big underground caverns and stuff, there's probably reptoids there, so it wouldn't friggin' surprise me. Yeah, because I'm like, I've never seen a track like this. I said, and, and if one had lost a toe, uh, there would have been room for it on, we'll say, the top of the pad. But no, this was just three toes, like it was supposed to be that way. You know, it, it, it could have, maybe it could have been a, a juvenile squatch that was born with three toes, some genetic hiccup. But it just didn't look that way. It didn't look like a squatch print. It, it was kind of flat and it didn't have a heel. It didn't have that impression of, of a heel or, or, you know, an arch or anything like that. So that was a bit of a mystery. Uh, well, now, next show, we got William Lunsford coming on and he's down in the Texarkana and Folk area. And he has actually got track casts of the three toed, whatever the hell it is that lived down there. You'll have to have him get a hold of me and show me these casts and. I'll see if they look alike. Yeah, they'll be on the show too. Because that will be interesting to compare. Yeah. So, yeah, yes. these don't they don't look like um they don't look like a bird, they don't look like a reptile. I mean it kind of looks like a big foot. The back of it looks like a big foot track. The front of it looks like three big honking toes. I don't know what the hell it is. Well yeah, this was was like that, but on a smaller scale. But we got uh, uh for for the last uh part of the six miles, excuse me. We got a very loud hollow wood knock. It wasn't, you know, it was one of those thump kind of sounds as we were going through this area. And as soon as I got into this one stretch, I knew immediately we were either being followed or being watched. So I kept my eyes open for that. Uh, and then we got the wood knock. So we went up a little further and stopped and, and uh, my partner did some uh, videotape and, and you could hear some noises in the bushes. But again, you can't make out what it is. We just figured, you know, it was that big old squatch making that big old thump. And then we got some other animals on the way out. We got a big cat, big uh, <clears throat> a bobcat, which was really cool. Because <clears throat> I haven't seen a bobcat in my area for years and years, you know, let alone tracks. Aren't you almost too far north? Aren't you up where it's like lynx and stuff up there? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm south. <clears throat> oh, south, okay. <laughs> right close to new york state oh okay yeah uh in this area it, it hasn't had uh, any gray wolves for 20 well more than 20 years now um uh, when i was a kid i used to see bobcats all the time or at least bobcat tracks we do get lynx down here and we get fishers and they just go through and eat just about everything but uh yeah 
the, the cats, I haven't seen any signs of them around here for years. Like we've got a small population of red wolves and I've seen those twice at two o'clock in the morning a few years ago. Are those and, things even indigenous to that area? Oh yeah, they're all over. Uh, yeah, because where I used to live in northern Minnesota, there was no such thing as a red wolf. The timber wolves would hate it. Well, I'd never seen a red wolf before except for in the zoo. So when the headlights hit it, to me at first it looked like a giant coyote. I'm thinking, that's a really big coyote. And then as I drove closer, I'm like, that's a red wolf. That's really cool. And I've seen it in, in the same area twice. I'd like to put trail cameras out, <clears throat> but I don't know who owns that property. Yeah, it'd be fun to get pictures of it, but yeah, there you go. So uh, run down the roster of your expeditions here since when last we talked to you. We're just kind of rambling around here now. Oh, yeah, like like I'm doing now because, of you know, I've had to put everything off until things settle down. Yeah, uh, I did go this year in February uh, as well. So I've, I've been back for uh, about a month now, you know, I did go into self-quarantine because somebody went to the airport the same day I got back with the virus. So oh, good, thing I, I, good thing I good thing I kept bathing myself in uh, the hand sanitizer. Yeah. Somebody probably yeah. thought I worked at a hospital. It's not like alcohol. <laughs> yeah, I got a great recipe in case uh, anybody's in one of those places where the toilet paper locusts came through and ate all the toilet paper and drank all the cleaning liquids. And you're trying to find like uh, hand sanitizer. You can make your own. The hillbillies gave me this recipe. They said you just mix uh some moonshine with a package of Jello and chill it. And there's your hillbilly hand sanitizer. And yeah, any of it that you don't use, you can eat afterwards. It's biodegradable. I would think the moonshine itself might do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shout out to the government. Give everybody a shot of uh, 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 moonshine. Give everybody a jug for the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've smelt moonshine before. I wasn't brave enough to try it. I didn't want to get put into a coma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the hillbilly hand sanitizer, I'm fairly certain it works because they said that like regular uh, grain alcohol doesn't work unless it's strong enough. And obviously <clears throat> that would be strong enough. Yeah. So even though it's hilarious, that actually would work. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, uh, February 2019, uh, I was at in, uh, in North Carolina because this is one of my spots. I mean, I always get something going on, whether it works regarding little people or Bigfoot in the Carolinas because it, it's a hot spot. Right. So you, you want to keep going to these areas or, you know, the general area of where you're getting all this action because you, you learn so much. Um, I was at a place called Standing Indian Wood Knocks all night. We heard them come from across the road, just knocking as they went. And they went, it was really foggy and misty up on the mountain. But we could hear them coming. I, I heard them coming, you know, before the partner of it, the dog and I heard them about the same time. I'm like, listen, listen. So they came from a distance from across the road. And then when they got to the road, it went quiet. And then they come across the road because then you got the two more wood knocks. And they were two knocks at a time when they came over. And then when they were all across the road, they went into a circular formation, wood knocking all the way. And we heard them go way up in the trail. And then all of a sudden there was three wood knocks. And that was the area where the three of us had went earlier that day. So I thought that is really cool. But there wasn't any hooping or hollering or anything other than these wood knocks, they were quiet. I'm like, they're either hunting or, or they're communicating in the mist to let each one of them know where the other one was. Yeah, it'd be a good time to go hunting. Just make a drive and scare the deer toward a couple of them that are sitting stationary waiting to grab them. The night after that, had a big black bear come within 10 feet of the tent. The dog, huh. she was smart. She didn't say a word. Because I know dogs will just shut down. They won't say anything unless they're they're trained to, to do that. And I'm like, what? Where's, where's the bear spray? Where's the bear spray? Because y'all know bears make me nervous. Where's the bear spray? And and I listen, and a bears have a kind of a certain walk where they'll, they'll, you know, kind of scuff the outside of their paws. So when I got up that next morning, we saw the bear prints in the mud. I was like, as long as it stays away, it had went up uh, up on a trail and dug out a, a hornet's nest or a beehive or something. 
and it got a good chunk of the, that hive out. But yeah, I mean, 10 feet of the tent, I'm like, that's pushing it a little bit. Yeah, no kidding. And it's like that one morning when I got up and I had a friggin' 19-inch track right in front of my tent. The big toe is like literally about two and a half inches from the edge of my tent. That's a grizzly. Wow. Yeah, no, that was a Bigfoot. <laughs> oh, Bigfoot. Okay. That's that's okay yeah. then. That was no, a big grizzlies foot. don't get that big. Yeah, yeah even like a, a huge. I actually <laughs> talked to the locals up in Alaska, an Alaskan brown bear, in order to have um, something anywhere close to an 18-inch long rear track would have to be three quarters of a ton and there are no grizzlies that big in montana well there, there's been some cases uh way way up north of me and in alaska of these giant bears oh yeah and then, then they usually turn to eating people and of yeah. course anything that eats people is always big because we're so full of, full of goodies well and they like to fib a lot about what's still up there from the ice age and claim that mm -hmm. some extinct when it isn't like the dire wolves and the shirt-faced bear. Mm-hmm. Well, we know that some of the bears that they tested up there do have that short-faced gene. I mean, they have the same DNA in them yeah. as the short-faced bear does. So, yeah. yeah, no wonder they're nasty. And as for, for uh, dire wolves, like, I, I believe the Shunkawarikin and the Wahalas that we have here are dire wolves. When I get reports about these huge wolves, we're not talking gray wolves or timber wolves or Mackenzie Valley wolves. These things are huge. They are built like barrels. They yeah. are built exactly how dire wolves look, even in the face. Uh, one woman, uh, and this is, you know, from my general area in, that's in Kingston, Ontario, uh, she was walking her dog. And this was in the early 2000s, so uh, that particular area across from the suburbs was kind of used as a scrap metal yard. And when she saw it, she says, I know what a wolf looks like. I know what gray wolves look like. This was too big to be a gray wolf. You know, they get big, but this was bigger than them. And she, and she went on to describe it. And um, as she's describing, I'm like, that's a dire wolf. Yep. And then one at one of our, our jails here, this is also in Kingston, uh, and they have a, it, it's a farm that, that the inmates run as part of rehabilitation. And he told me, you know, he was in there for less, for, for oh, petty theft, but he had seen it when he was bringing in one of the cows. It, it was, you know, not too far away where he couldn't have got a good look at it. And again, he says, I know what wolves look like. And this was too big to be the timber wolf. Timber wolves aren't exactly small either. They're freaking huge. I grew up where they live normally. And, you know, you're talking about the dire wolf uh, slash Wahila. There's reports of them coming out of the Nahani Valley, the Valley of Headless Men. Yep. Where you have the Naha, the Nakani, the Wahila, and the short faced bear. Yep. And something else that can throw boulders a long way. Yeah, um, apparently all live in that valley. Yeah, giants called Nuklucks. Yeah. Uh, we got pterodactyls and something described as a brontosaurus because there's supposed to be a valley in there that winter never touches. Uh, well, that's I, literally true. They know there's a geothermally heated valley there. That's already yeah. been explored. People got I uh, My cousin's husband, he, he was a, a fisherman, a guide, a hunter, and he would go all over the place uh, to do all these expeditions. And when he went to Nahani Valley, he said he had a sinister feeling about it. And this man wasn't scared of much. Uh, uh, well, the haunted house that my aunt and uncle lived in that had that the, the little person living between the walls. That place was really haunted. Uh, one night it was my, uh, my aunt, my uncle, uh, my cousin, and of course Lyman. This is who I'm talking about. That was one of my cousin's husbands and my sister and her husband. And they were playing cards at the table, and there was a white face at the window. It was a ghost, of course, of an old man looking in at them. And Lyman was the first to run out to see what was going on. And Lyman was a big, big man. He was pushing nearly seven feet tall and well over 300 pounds. He was huge. But when he said, you know, that that place gave, you know, gave him the creeps. So there's something to be said about that. Yeah, no kidding. It sounds like not the, maybe not the best place to live. I've lived no. in a couple of haunted houses, but I never had anything happen while I was there because, you know, I'm a bummer to ghosts or something. They just take a vacation when I'm living there and come back after I leave again. 
Yeah, I've lived in a couple of haunted places, too. I've seen stuff. Uh, one of the places I lived in, I had the balls of light coming down the stairs. You know, they were just glowing, throbbing balls of light. And it was just kind of, oh, well, that's cool. And the woman, every once in a while, she would be at the front door uh, crying, dressed in black. I figured somebody she knew died. But that place, um, every night around 2 o'clock, the knocking in the walls would start. And it wasn't rats or mice or anything. And I didn't appreciate getting woke up, right? My kids are still little. Right. Don't wake me up. And I'd tell it, you know, shut the hell up. And it would go on sleep. for a few more minutes and then it would stop. And it didn't bother my kids. They were just like, is that noise again? We're trying to sleep. We got to get up for school. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I brought my kids up not to be afraid of stuff like that. I guess it worked. <laughs> yeah, good deal. You got that part of it right for sure. You're going to like a show that I'm trying to, to get scheduled here now. I was contacted by somebody that actually had a whole bunch of experiences growing up on a property that apparently had conquistadors gold hidden and buried on it. And as a consequence of this, or they were already there and they just kind of noticed that the conquistador gold was buried on their land, but the Duende lived there. And so he had them around the property the whole time he was growing up. Well, we do know that little people like shiny things, yep. uh, and it, whether it be rocks or gold. So I have no doubt that they claim that gold is theirs because it's shiny and it's in their area. What we do know now is that there are two types of Duende. And this is really cool because I didn't know that until, you know, late last year. Because I was talking to a woman from the Philippines about this here. There are two types of Duende. And she says, and depending on what part of the country you're in and what your belief system is, that they can be good or they can be bad. She said, you have the bad Duandes, which cause a lot, a lot of havoc, and they're particularly nasty, and they don't really like people, but, you know, they, they don't do anything to hurt us. They're not like Pukwudgies. And then you have the other ones who live in trees, and they're not monkeys. And she went on to describe them. I'm thinking, well, maybe it's kind of a gnome. But no, uh, what she's describing is Homo Luzon. Wow. Uh, because they are so proficient in climbing. And it is, it is a, a thing that Homo Luzon has in, in it, it, its skeleton that they believe it was a proficient climber. But it's not a monkey. This is a proto-pygmy. It is a little person. So we have the two types of Dewande. Because I, I'm assuming it, it's like in Alaska where they put all the little people into a group and call them the urchin rack. Every little person, good or bad, is an urchin rack. So I'm thinking Duende is the same way. Like, every little person, good or bad, is a Duende. It just depends on which one you have to deal with. Wow. Yeah. Um, makes you wonder where you got some of these similar descriptions from different parts of the continent with different names. If it, you know, some of them are just basically the same thing, and they just have a different regional name for it. But oh, then, yeah. uh, you know, other ones, it seems like they... They actually are something different, so it's got to be a lot of effort trying to sort through all of it and figure out what's what. It is. You have to read their descriptions and their behaviors. Like with the Nurumbi, the, the, the Crow people, the Crow Nation, First Nations, call them Nurumbis. The Sioux call them something completely different because <laughs> the Sioux people are were at that time, you know, afraid of them. Yeah, something that translates into uh, tiny prairie demons that massacre the hell out of our braves when we're not careful. Yep. That's exactly right, because they protect the Crow people. They have a, a symbiotic uh, relationship, and, and they're friends. And it's like a lot uh, of little people, it, is you have to make friends with them first. You have to coexist, be friendly with them. And I do, I'm trying to do that. It, you know, when I'm in my areas, I'll just start talking to them, uh, hoping that they're in the area. So then they'll, they'll hear me, and then you know, become familiar to me. Now, I, I did go out um, to, uh, first of last week on one of the warm days we had, and I got, you know, my first little tracks of, of the year. You know, they're in their spots all year around. But the few times I did go out, of the, out this winter, you know, because that's a bit of work. I had to put my snowshoes on and bundle up and, and look like an Eskimo myself <laughs> <laughs> and, and go out. And, you know, I'm out for hours, and, I, and uh, I don't have a snowmobile. I have a four-wheeler, and I can't take the four-wheeler where I go in the winter. So it's a trek because I take everything in my backpack. So I didn't get any track a couple of times that I was out. 
but yeah, they, they're back and, and, you know, they're doing what they do and everything. So I was so happy to see that. Uh, no May May tracks, but the little First Nations people. And I do ask them, you know, I would like to talk to you. I'd like you to come up to me. But if it gets to that point, it, it's going to take a long time to build up their trust. Yeah. Yeah, I get the impression that some of these little people live a tremendously long time. So they probably wouldn't be in any big hurry to trust you and make friends with you anyway. Yeah, because I, I think it's a case of it's on their time and not our time, but uh, they are aware that compared to them, we have short lives. Like with with gnomes and all that gnome family, like leprechauns, uh, they're known to stay with families for generations. Uh, uh, one was like 110 years for one particular gnome. Yeah. Or so in the case of uh, Brett and his girlfriend, Becky, down there in Texas, uh, could be the same puck wedgies that have been following around harassing the family for three generations. Exactly. Exactly so. And with with, with puck wedgies, uh, uh, all they seem to see is males. So where are the females? The females must stay at home and look after the young. Yeah. Who knows <laughs> with those weird things. Well, yeah, exactly, because and, with the native little people, you see both male and female. Yeah. Uh, just on the Appalachian Trail, uh, a gentleman had contacted me, and he had a rock thrown at him, and when he turned, he saw a little female, which I always love, because I do get them, but not a whole lot of them. And when he turned to see her, she dropped the knife and ran. So I said, well, you know, either she left the knife for you, uh, you know, because she threw a rock at you. She wanted to get your attention. Obviously, she didn't want to hide, or she wouldn't have did anything. Because these guys, remember, they are highly intelligent. They are, and they are, you know, cunning, and they are smart. So, yeah, so she threw the rock at him, dropped the knife. So the knife, this little knife, was probably for him. But he didn't know that at the time. And I said, well, go back and check. If it's there, leave something for them. But, of course, the, the knife was gone. So it, it might be years before they try to make contact with him again if ever yeah. sometimes you, it's it's a one-time deal yeah well some of the one-time deals they try and make your ones you shouldn't accept like hey you want to come into the underground and check out where we live uh no yeah you see, a, a few times i've had that happen in one of my areas where i'll hear them call my name but it sounds like a joke so i'll just ignore them uh but down in in pisca uh, my partner and I rented a, a cabin for a couple of days to do research around the area. The first night I was there, I, I heard uh, we, a bunch of cottages just around this one particular area, and it has a power box uh, just right under the bit of a hill. Okay, and it gets really dark there, even if there was a yard light. And I heard what sounded like nails scraping right against this power box with a heck of a. And it gave me a good start. And, and I go in and I tell my partner what I saw. And he brings out the thermals and he's looking. Of course, he doesn't see anything. And then the next night, I'm outside on the porch. And I'm a smoker, so I'm having a cigarette. And then I heard, Robin, hey, Robbie. And I'm like, it's little people. And I'm like thinking, you little buggers. Because I... You know, I just learned to expect the unexpected now. Yeah. And, and I went in and I told my partner. And he's like, well, how do they know who you are? I said, because they were listening to us talk inside the house. <laughs> you know, we, we'd been there for two days. They know my name. They know his name. They know what we're up to. They've been listening the whole time. Yeah. And we noticed that there's a great big X, X, uh, X tree formation right behind the cabin. Uh -huh. I'm like, you picked a great spot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah. Well, yeah, we don't have, if we can't can't find any little people, we can do some Bigfoot research while we're here. Yeah, just just combine it all. Yeah. I mean we did hear, hear some hooping and hollering far off in the distance the last night. I'm like, You hearing that? And I think he got that on video or uh, recorder. Yeah, so it was really cool. We're like, You hear that? I was like, Yeah, this is cool. Like you picked an awesome spot. <laughs> so yeah, it, it was uh, and that was just February this year. Uh, we went into an area um, close to Dillard, Georgia, down on the mountain. And that place was just amazing. So we weren't even there 10 minutes and we got a whoop and then a wood knock. Wow. And then we were walking down in and it sounds almost like a creaky tree, but it's not a creaky tree. I mean, a, cre a tree doesn't stop cr 
creaking just because you walk up to it. And it was the strangest, and I've never heard anything like it. And it went, and it went on and on and on. And we're all stopping and listening, and we're waiting for something to come out of the bushes. Uh, our friend, he's a hunter, and he has been all his life. He knows all the animals in the area. And uh, my partner's like, is that a, a wild pig? And I'm like, that's not a pig. And is, is it a bear? No, it's not a bear either. And it was, e, 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 and it was just amazing. And I'm thinking later, stupid us, we should have looked up in the damn tree. Because we were just waiting for something to come out of the ground, you know, yeah. out of the bushes on the ground. And yeah. then, I mean, we're going around this area. We're finding bedding areas, uh, all the, the, with the roofs that are all woven in together. And, and this entire place was like that. I mean, there was uh, X, the, the X markers. There, there was the, the bent overs with, with a small teepee type thing. And then we got further down into this valley, and, and that's, and that's where we really found all these 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 nesting areas with the roofs on them, just intricate weavings. Just and it was just one that I have, uh, and oh, Brian's probably showing that right now. It's just beautiful. As we're going, we're finding juvenile tracks, juvenile tracks, and we only found one set of uh, uh, adult tracks. And, and our friend, he's staring at the tree. And then he says, I know I saw something. And he's the most honest person that, that, that I've ever met in my entire life. And so we go over and of course we don't see anything. And I'm wondering if what we heard, because this has never happened to me before, was a juvenile up in a tree, uh, you know, you know, carrying on. E -e 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 -e. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going and I'm looking through gorilla sound and chimp sound and other animal sounds, there's nothing. The closest that I can find is a macaque, and a, a macaque alert call. But no, it's not I, quite the same, but it, it has the same pattern. Right, like I was saying when you were talking about this earlier, the only thing that I've heard in the woods that sounds like that at all is a porcupine. Yeah, and, and the, no porcupines. Mm -hmm. Not even signs of porcupines. I mean, and then the only thing that was actually in that, that area was a, was a bird, but it flew away. Now, uh, my friends did go back last weekend to the, to the other side of this area, and they found some more bedding and nesting areas and what m might appear to be tracks. Oh, cool. So, yeah, it, it's a bit of a hot spot. So they put out some recorders and uh, some trail cams. Nice. So they'll, they'll leave them there for a month and see what they get, and they'll, they'll let me know. But, yeah, I mean, it was just... This last trip, every place we went, we had something happen, which was, it was a good time to go. Yeah, I remember last summer I was trying to keep up with stuff that was coming out on your channel and where you were going next and what was happening. And, of course, I'm busy during the summer, too, so it proved to be impossible, and I lost track of it after a while. But uh, I know you had all kinds of stuff going on last summer, and now that it's getting into the warmer parts of the year, you got stuff going on again. Yeah, yeah. Of course, everything is on a halt right now. Yeah. Because of what everything is going on. Because of the commie plague, yeah. Yeah, because as, as soon as it, it, it quiets down and everybody figures it, figures this thing out, then I'm, I'm gone again. Because I, I don't believe that it's just about sitting here gathering research. I believe you have to get out into the field as well. I mean, you have to compare notes with, with other people and other fellow researchers because this is how knowledge grows. Okay, if this is happened to you and this has happened to me or when this has happened to somebody else that that's information that you, you've gathered together exactly that's how you establish patterns and you start patterning the activities and behavior of the subject that you're trying to figure out about yeah exactly like if uh uh like for for next year i would like to go back to the same area where we heard this this weird noise and see if this happens again and that this time i'll know to look up <laughs> doesn't necessarily and, uh, mean you'll see anything but at it, least, oh i got thermals which you know i didn't take on that trip i didn't think i was going to need the thermals but yeah i'm going to be taking the thermals every single time now you always need the thermal and never forget like master poe told me when i was just a young grasshopper at the shaolin school of squatching <laughs> he said grasshopper you cannot find sasquatch you must make sasquatch find you 
Exactly. We're about to run out of time here. Was there any other um, things that you wanted to relate? Well, I've got that Bigfoot hair. And I like to talk about that Bigfoot hair because it's annoyed the heck right out of me. So, uh, last summer, I, I got Bigfoot hair. I I've analyzed it under a microscope. There is nothing else like it. Okay, the, the cuticle itself is so tight, it's practically waterproof. Uh, I actually ha had to use what we call gum, uh, not actual gum that you chew or anything, under the microscope to put it on a slide. Because the cuticle is so tight, that's the outside of the hair. And, and on the inside of the hair, in the medulla, it is black. It is a solid black line. It is unbroken. It is black. Okay. And that that is like the gold signature for Bigfoot hair. Okay. There's, there's nothing else like it. Uh, it. It's made up of, of three colors throughout the hair shaft. It's black, charcoal black, uh, a, bra a brassy color and a brown, I mean, perfect camouflage color. And I, I called lab after lab after lab and either they don't do the particular test we need. Uh, uh, the one tech I did talk to, she was really interested in it. And she actually talked Bigfoot talk to me, which always astonishes me. And she would have did it except for their lab don't do that test. And lo and behold, I finally found a lab that does only wild animals. So I call them and I talk to them and I tell them, you know, this is what I got. And, you know, he gets into the, his, his spew about, well, the problem with Bigfoot hair is we don't have anything to attest that to. And I'm already aware of this. So yeah, I said, we do. It's listed in Zoo Bank. It's called the Ketchum DNA study. And uh, I said to him, if it comes back as unknown species or unknown primate, or unknown something that's still a bonus for us and he, uh yeah he says yeah yeah we're not going to touch that and that was the end of the conversation so how, how can you uh because scientists are so open-minded and they want to find out the truth yeah, yeah that's right. sure and, and they do how are you supposed to get anything to compare it to if you don't recognize it as something come to compare it to and what does it matter anyways? Whatever it is, it's my money paying for it. Yeah. But like I said, like, like I keep saying, I'm not done. And you haven't heard the last of it because I will keep going until I find somebody who will do this test. Because this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. I have other biologicals. I know somebody else that tried to do a test for one of my other guests and as a result lost their job at the lab. They, they lost their job for doing their job. Exactly. Which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I mean... Well, that's the state of our um, academic science. It's freaking ridiculous. This cover experts are not interested in the truth. Yeah, which, which is, is, is r ridiculous. I mean, uh, you go out to look for an unknown species, uh, whatever it is, okay, you have pictures, you have videos, you have all this proof, and... Let, let's just say, like, it's a bird. Just for example, it's a bird. So you get all this evidence, you bring it back. They, oh, this is a new species of bird. This is fabulous. You bring the same type of evidence uh, of, of Bigfoot, all oh, that it's not real. That is the wrong way to look at this. Okay. They are not doing their job when they ignore evidence. Yeah, and, why, and, why isn't Bigfoot real? Well, there's no evidence for it. Well, we have evidence right here. Well, we're not going to look at it. Well, why not? Because Bigfoot isn't real. Right. Circular logic, complete idiocy. One lab suggested I get blood, and I'm and I'm, I'm envisioning in my head me sneaking up behind a Bigfoot with a needle, going to get it in its backside to draw blood, and then I'm well, get you need blood for you get the same like DNA that. out of a hair or anything else. Yeah, I mean, how are you going to get blood samples by by killing one? We don't need to do that anymore. They are yeah. DNA darts. I mean, because I am so against killing any kind of Bigfoot. I mean, not only do you, you, you risk your life. I, I mean, imagine what people would do to you if they did find out. And it's not that they would stop at one Bigfoot body. Everybody want to, would want a piece of that until it was gone. Well, then let's go out and get another one. And then let's get another one. 
a uh, tribe in the pack west that uh, believes that if you sh kill a Bigfoot within seven years, you're going to die. I wish everybody else believed that. And it's probably takes them seven years for that Bigfoot group family unit to find you and hunt you down. Yeah. I mean, we have the Ape Canyon uh, uh, report. I mean, they shot one. They're pretty sure that they killed it. And they, they had that entire group descend on their cabin during the night. Because I believe that's exactly what happens if you shoot a member of a Bigfoot family, especially if it's if it's like uh, the, the monarch female or the head male. You're in a lot of trouble. Yep. I do agree with you. Yeah, there's just no need to go out and, and kill, you know, 10 Bigfoot to, to prove his existence. We have all this evidence and we're being ignored. And I really do think that it's the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard. Anything else, if it's a bird or a canine or, or a cat, you have all the same evidence identified as a new species, but when it comes to Bigfoot, well, it's not real, and they won't even look at it. They won't even consider it, which is just stupid. Yeah. They're so stark, raving stupid, they won't even look at the evidence. Now, that's stupid. It is. It's what I've started calling smart, stupid people. Yeah, they're not smart. They're just stupid. That's the difference between intelligence and wisdom. They may have a high intelligence score, but their wisdom score is below the chart. And then I tell, you, and I tell you what makes it really sad is I don't have a degree in anything, but I had the same uh, kind of training as most of these do, as most of these people do, because, you know, my background is, is animal sciences with a focus on behavior. Okay, I don't have a PhD, but, you know, when, when you're told about Bigfoot all your life, and, and it's a part of your culture, your heritage, and you've even seen them. I, I'm, and I mean, you always believe it's real. So then I, I've been doing this for 40 years now, and we're not any further ahead uh, in proving his existence than we were when I was a kid. And it's absolutely just, it baffles me. It, it's just right, pure ignorance. No, we've got all the evidence that we need. We've already sequenced his DNA. It's already listed in Zubank. Um, we know he's an adjacent hominid. We know it's not an ape running around the woods. And but science just won't look at all the evidence that we got. No, it, it, it's it's just stupid. It's plain and simple. It's it's stupid. Yeah, well, it's a cover up because who's paying their bills? Right. That's the people that don't want this information coming out. So they're not going to pay them to actually look into it. And if they do look into it, they're going to go threaten their job or family to make them stop because they yeah. don't want it coming out. Well, I do have another project coming out over the next month and it's just simply called a uh, strange realms bigfoot project uh and and i'm not going to go all into it now we're almost out of time but uh you can be on the lookout for that uh because well i need help in proving all this stuff i've got and so on and so forth so you can look into that uh later on this month when i get that up and going all right you heard the lady jump in there and help her we all need help and if she needs your help help her because there's not like a zillion people out there doing hobbit research and she's doing that plus doing the research on the big one and everything else so if you need your help jump in there oh, and help one cool thing before we go this is really cool uh when i was up in, in natahala uh last year i i found these really huge wolf prints okay and i'm looking at it and and i'm like these are really big and i'm being told it, it's a red wolf and in the back of my mind i knew something was up Okay, uh, these were just a bit too big to be a red wolf. So I'm like, well, maybe it's just a big red wolf. But still there, I've got a doubt in my mind. And then later, I see a posting that somebody's pet gray wolf got out and was running around Nantahala. <laughs> I'm like, wow. And that was so cool because somebody sent that to me because I had mentioned that before. So I appreciate that greatly because I just thought that was cool. <laughs> they did catch it, of course. Nice. You know, they had to go out and get it, you know. But it, it's a wolf. It's going to go out roaming. I mean, you know, it yeah. was just really cool. Well, at least they caught him and they got him back again. Yeah, it, it did. Because, you know, we, we have uh, all these places for, for wild animals uh, uh, that people 
you know, they, they look after the animals out of the goodness of their heart for, for whatever reason, you know, uh, the animal gets too big and they don't want it anymore. So we have all, uh, both Canada and America have these places. So yeah, they're fabulous and they really look after those animals. So it's, it, like I said, it's great. Right on. Okay. Well, with that then, don't you guys forget where to go to find Robin at Strange Realms on Facebook, YouTube, and a dot com. A dot net. And, uh, dot net, excuse me. I've been trying to get dot com. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll, you'll just keep working on it. You'll get it eventually. But anyway, strangerealms.net and on Facebook and YouTube. Go check out her channel. Give her some love. Subscribe. And uh, you can do the same thing with my channel. Check to make sure you're still, still subscribed. Everybody's losing subscribers. Um, YouTube, flaky, weird, screwing around with people, especially anybody that puts any truth out there. Then we get suppressed and the people that are spreading garbage get promoted. So make sure you're subscribed. If you're not, uh, you might want to consider doing that. And uh, if you are subscribed, ding the notification bell, and then you will get notified when I actually put out a video. In fact, now they got a drop down menu. So I, I recommend clicking all because, you know, like all the videos that turned out are pretty much cool. So you want to see those. <laughs> and also, if you want to support the channel, of course you can at World Bigfoot Central. Uh, that would be paypal.me forward slash World Bigfoot Central. Also, you can contact me at worldbigfootcentralyahoo.com. And if you're in the mood for some stylish wear, we have T-shirts available. Go to Teesprings for its slash stores for its slash world hyphen Bigfoot hyphen radio. And that would be my storefront there. And I got three different designs up right now. They're really cool looking. One of them is a really hilarious, glorious artwork done by Devin King. And it is a... Warning, uh, Duke's, uh, Duke's Squatching Tips number one, do not feed the Sasquatch. So go check it out. Um, new designs are going to be available soon, and the ones that I have will soon have other things available, women's T-shirts and whatnot. But for right now, they are available in T-shirts, hoodies, and also in mugs. So go check that out. And with that, thank you all for tuning in, for listening to the show. And I'll see you all again next week. And thank you again, Robin, for being on with us. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me back. You know, we always have a great time. And keep it on the strange side and don't puck the poke the puck wedgies. Definitely. And like I always say, don't punt the puck wedgie. Don't punt the puck wedgie. <laughs> and don't hug the Wookiee because A <laughs> might crush you and B will give them that virus thing. So don't do it. <laughs> see you later, folks.